Greetings and welcome to the second event in the Geese College of Business Global Challenges in Business webinar series. I'm Amanda Brett Brantner, Senior Associate Director of Online Programs here at Geese College of Business, and I look forward to spending the next hour with all of you. Before we get started, I want to cover a few housekeeping items related to the Q&A portion of today's session. Please submit all of your questions via the Zoom Q&A feature. Your questions will be submitted publicly for the whole audience to see. To develop consensus around questions, participants should use upvoting. The upvote thumb is located next to the question in the Q&A window. You can only upvote once, but you can reverse your vote. We will bring the top questions to Professor Torelli following his presentation. Any general housekeeping questions will be answered in text by the GEESE team working in the background. Questions submitted via chat will not be taken. At this time, I am pleased to welcome my colleague Rob Towner to introduce the session and Professor Carlos Torelli. Hello, everyone. It is nice to meet you. My name is Rob Towner, and I lead the admissions and recruitment for online programs. I have the pleasure of introducing today's presenter. Carlos J. Torelli is Professor of Marketing and Executive Director of Professional and Executive Education in Geese College of Business, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He is an expert on global branding and cross-cultural consumer psychology. He is the author of Strategic Brand Management, Lessons for Winning Brands in Globalized Markets, as well as Globalization, Culture, and Branding, How to Leverage Cultural Equity for Branding I, or building iconic brands in the era of globalization, and numerous articles published in the Journal of Marketing, Journal of Consumer Behavior, and Journal of Consumer Psychology. Before becoming an academic, Professor Torelli was the Marketing Vice President of Citibank in Venezuela and Turkey. I would like to now welcome Carlos Torelli. Well, thanks for having me here and thanks for joining me in this webinar. You know, I think this is a, a, a very timely topic to discuss, you know, what could be the consequences of this crisis for consumer behavior. And, you know, what we're going to be covering in the seminar, what I'm going to try to, to do today is first talk about the direct consequences. You know, there are a lot of obvious things that we know are happening. Uh, you're not going to cover them, and definitely, then I got towards the end. We can we can revisit them, but I want to go a little bit deeper into the psychological consequences of uh, people's perception of infectious diseases being uh, a, an issue that's going to stay probably for long. So one of the characteristics of this crisis is that there seems to be consensus that this is not going to go away immediately. You know, it's highly unlikely that what's going to happen is that, you know, in a month we're going to be 100% back to normal. You know, most of the experts believe that this is probably going to linger for anything between 6, 12, 18 months in terms of the consequences, not necessarily in terms of the of the, of the virus itself. You know, I don't know exactly how long that could be, and I think nobody knows. But uh, nobody's predicting, you know, uh, an immediate recovery after this and completely going back to normal. So these issues about uh, how people respond to infectious diseases is something that probably is going to be staying with us for a while. It's going to have consequences for consumer behavior. So I'm going to talk towards the end of my of my of, of this webinar. I'm going to talk about more of those psychological consequences. Ultimately, uh, what we want also is to help you, uh, uh, you know, if, if you are a marketer, to understand how do you deal with this? What are the things that you do in your business to cope with the challenges that, that the coronavirus crisis is bringing to the marketplace? So at this time, I'm going to share my screen uh, to try to help in this conversation. All right. So 
The outline for today's webinar is, as I said, we're going to start covering the direct consequences, and then we're going to move into the psychology of consumer responses to threats from infectious diseases. And in particular, I'm going to cover here not only how people respond to the threat of infectious diseases, but also what happens when we start thinking about our mortality, which is something that, that that's a, a, an important characteristic of this pandemic. It's, it's not only a you know, highly contagious virus, but it's also a scary one because we see all these stories about people dying from it. Uh, then I'm going to cover the cultural differences in responses to these threats. One of the things that we know is that not everybody responds to threats similarly. And so cultures nurture a heavier emphasis on safety concerns than others. So I'm going to try to uh, discuss some of these uh, issues to see how we can predict how people in different parts of the world might respond differently uh, to this crisis, and particularly in the longer term. In the short term, I think we all are responding relatively similarly, but in the longer term, we're going to see that there might be some differences. Finally, I'm going to try to summarize at the end, how should business respond to this crisis? So let's move on. You know, the, the, some of the direct consequences, you know, we, we see them in the news. You know, it's, it's, it's very clear. We see the hoarding and price gouging of, of shelf essentials. Uh, you know, we heard all those news and, and we've seen how, how things like toilet paper are becoming very hard to to find, uh, uh, and I'm going to talk in a minute why it, that's the case. But some of the other consequences are telecommuting, you know, with social distance being implemented uh, in most countries, and here in the United States, almost 98% of the country is in some sort of a stay in, stay in place kind of a, a resolution, then telecommuting is becoming more popular. And people are starting to see, although telecommuting has been around for a while, I think this is, this is a direct consequence now that we are all leaving. The streaming, the use of streaming services and online buying is another direct consequence of, of this pandemic. Uh, you know, the use of services like Amazon and Netflix and online shopping. You know, I've never in my life bought groceries online up until last week. Uh, so some of some of these things people have been doing for a while, but many people have not been introduced to this and it is becoming for a while kind of a new normal. So if we think more specific about these notions of hoarding of shelf stable essentials, what are we talking about here? We're talking about canned soup, frozen foods, cereal, pasta, toilet paper, cleaning and disinfecting products. So th these are things that we know that in groceries are flying off the shelves. Uh, Cleaning and disinfecting products in particular is becoming very, very scarce resource and, and, and toilet paper. And you know, one of the things that what, what happens to people during, during this type of situations is that people want to regain some sort of control of their life and they want to prepare for what's to come. You know, one of the big issues with this, with this pandemic is that it's very novel. You know, it's the novel coronavirus. We don't know where this thing is going. So when people are under uncertainty, they want to gain some level of control in their lives and then buying these things that we know that eventually we will consume them, you know, particularly toilet paper. That, that's one that would say, well, you know, how much is, is, do you need toilet paper uh, for six months? Well, I know I'm going to use it anyway. So I, I, I gain some sense of control by having all these products in my possession. And that's one way in which people cope with uncertainty. So. In the same way that we see this happening, we see it in the marketplace. For instance, companies like General Mills, uh, the stock price of General Mills, I, I show here the stock price in the last month, uh, it, it has gone up 6.6%, whereas the, the Dow Jones Industrial Index in the same period has, has come down 13.8%. And you know, where right now, you know, if we, if we look at this graph, uh, you know, there was a point in which we were down almost 25, 26% in the Dow Jones. Uh, so we're back to, to, to a little bit of a more positive territory. And, you know, this was as of yesterday. I think the Dow was going up today. So I, I didn't update the figures today. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, and there's going to be fluctuation. And this is depending on how people perceive that things are going. But nonetheless, overall, companies like General Mills are outperforming the market. This General Mills is the quintessential, you know, uh, uh, stable products that that we can that we can accumulate. Clorox company is another good example. Another one that's going up 3.7 percent. It ha has up and down, but this is, has to do with cleaning products. Uh, Costco, you know, the retailer, so slightly up. Uh, all retailers are being hammered heavily during this pandemic. Well, but companies like Costco and you know we could do the same for Walmart they are doing relatively better and because they, they are big big 
big companies selling all these essentials that people are, are accumulating. You know, in terms of, of price gouging, it's something that's been in the news, uh, 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 particularly at the beginning of the pandemic was very obvious. And we saw how Amazon suspended multiple sellers for coronavirus related price gouging. You know, finding hand sanitizer online, it, you can find it at, at ridiculous, outrageous uh, prices. You know, even the government got involved signing an executive order to prevent price gouging. Uh, and so these are things that are happening. This, this is where very immediate. You know, we're seeing a little bit of a stabilization of the market, but still, still, uh, it's still going on. You know, like I, I was just today, I went just to Amazon because I have, I have no chance now to go to the barber shop. So I was going to buy a, you know, a hair clipper. Well, there are no hair clippers available until in Amazon until later April. So that this is kind of the consequences. People preparing themselves, trying to gain this some sense of control. So we see that, that that's some of the direct consequences. Telecommuting. Well, we're now doing this via Zoom. Zoom was a well-known company for people in certain industry, but now Zoom is, is becoming the staple of our today daily, daily lives. You know, the stock is now up 3.9%, but at a point in time uh, 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 in the, you know, late March, uh, it was up 50%, 5-0%. You know, and one of the things that, that in terms of what, what, what could happen in the near future or in the, or in the midterm and longer term is that people are starting to uh, uh, test these technologies and see how useful they can be. You know, I teach in the IMBA. There are many of my IMBA, former IMBA students and those enrolled in other courses in the IMBA program. And you all know the, the quality of online education once you do it right. But many, many people are not aware of that. And now people being forced to use these technologies. This is something that also probably is not only going to be a direct consequence, but might have consequences uh, in the midterm and long term. Netflix is another, it's another good company that, that, that people are, are going crazy during this time. You know, you at your home probably, probably live through this. You know, everybody in the family uh, uh, watching Netflix, stock is up 1.8%. Uh, Amazon, well, Amazon is one of the companies in, in, a, in, a, in a hiring spree during the coronavirus crisis. Uh, I think they were hiring tens of thousands of, of, of employees to really cope with the delivery and the fulfillment of all the, the orders that they are getting. So these are some of the consequences that we, you know, you don't have to be, you know, a, 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 a magician to predict these things. You would know that with social distancing and with people trying to gain control, these things would happen. And, and these are, these are, it's good to check that, that this, this, these predictions uh, really take place. You know, it provides some, some sense of understanding of the market. But what beyond that could happen? So what I'm gonna try to cover next is the more psychological responses that are probably gonna be important in the mid and long term. Right now, we are all under social distancing. So we're staying at home with our families. We go outside and we know we need to stay six feet apart. Uh, but eventually, that, that's going to go away. Eventually, we're going to come back to some sort of normal. Well, well, well that new normal is going to be a new normal in which the threat from infectious diseases is not going to go away. That, that's going to stay. We don't know for how long until there is a, a vaccine for this, for this virus, until there is a good treatment for this virus. So this is something that's gonna stay with us for a while. What happens for us psychologically when that's the case? Well, it's, it's not a very novel thing for humans. Humans have been concerned about infectious diseases for millennia since humans have been around there's been always this threat from infectious diseases and you know in 200 300 years ago we didn't know we didn't have a clue you know what drove them now we understand them nonetheless we common human beings although we understand it we are hardwired in our evolutionary process to defend from these things so that's one of the consequences of a threat from infectious diseases is it activates what we call the behavioral immune system. Is this innate uh, tendency that we have to protect from infectious diseases? And then I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a minute. The other thing that happens when, when, when there is a threat from infectious diseases is that people become more conformist and people try to conform more their behaviors to the norms and, and the attitudes. It's important, you know, during, during pandemics to have social order. 
uh, you know, if we don't follow the orders, if we don't, if we try to respect the staying six feet apart, but not everybody else want to do it, then I cannot, I cannot really function properly because I am not abiding to the rules. So people become more cognizant of norms and rules and they want people to follow them. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that also in a minute. Finally, social avoidance in general. You know, right now we have an imposed social avoidance. But after this is gone, there's going to be some level of social avoidance that people are still going to, going to experience. Because again, that, that, that's the, the evolutionary process uh, that, that helps us to cope with these decisions. We know that, that we get this from other people. We don't know exactly in the past, we didn't know how, now we know better. Uh, and we're still learning about this virus, how we get it, whether it stays from people who are asymptomatic, whether it stays in the air for this or that. So, but we have this naive understanding that if we avoid people, we're less likely to catch it. So these are three things that are going to be top of mind in people's behaviors in the months to come. And let's go a little bit more in detail in each one of them. So this notion of signal detection problem or, or this idea that when we are aware that infectious diseases are around, we, we become hyper vigilant uh, in trying to detect somebody that could uh, that could carry the infectious disease uh, is, is there because there is a very high cost to what we call a false negative error. A false negative error is I see somebody, that somebody is carrying the disease and I don't detect it. If that happens, that's very risky for the individual because I might get infected. So evolutionarily, we develop this, this defense mechanism in which we try to minimize the false negatives. We, we might actually maximize the false positives, which is trying to believe that somebody has the disease but doesn't have it. But the risk of that is less than the risk of undetecting a negative because that the undetected negative is the one that can contaminate me. So then this is also called the, the smoke detector effect. You know, a smoke detector uh, activates itself with a very, very tiny little bit of smoke. You know, you fry eggs and sometimes you trigger the smoke detector. In the same way, we become hypersensitive to any superficial cue in the environment that could be an indicative of potential disease. So then we associate risk of infection with a broad range of superficial cues. For instance, deviation from typical uh, physical and visual norms may be interpreted as evidence of infection. And there is research that, that, that shows that do, when people feel threatened from infectious diseases, they become hypervigilant and they, and they try to separate themselves from individuals who are not normative, people who are disfigured, people who are disabled, the obese, the old people, you know, people who don't conform to, you know, what you have is the prototypical standard on an indiv of, of a healthy individual. Uh, well, another thing that, that also happens, of course, is that people avoid used products and they are willing to pay more for, for, for new products. And then it's a very heavy emphasis on cleanliness. So that's another of this psychological response. So this, these things are kind of automatic. We develop them. We don't have to really think too much. It's kind of hardwired in our evolutionary uh, psychological system. Well, we see some effects of this and some of the obvious one, we see reports uh, that highlight the emerging trends of uh, discrimination against Asian American. Being this virus or originated in, in China, and you know, I'm not gonna talk about politics, but we know there's been some attempts to link this uh, in the public domain uh, to, to Asia. Uh, well, not surprisingly, there is some, some uh, effects we see in society, some, some tendency toward discrimination against Asian Americans in the United States and other parts of the world. But this overall broader smoke detector, I'm trying to, de to, to try to separate myself from people who are not typical. It's also driving uh, discrimination against minorities in general. And there are recent news that there, are, there is a, a higher likelihood of discrimination against black Americans in the United States uh, driven by coronavirus after coronavirus than in the past. And, th and that's again, that's associated with this idea that in society, whatever is we think is the standard, which is the majority, that's kind of the norm in terms of my social perception, then anybody who deviates from the norm becomes a suspect, a potential candidate for carrying the disease. So this is, this is another uh, example of how we become hyper protected. This notion of conforming to norms is another tendency. Uh, again, 
protecting the social order becomes critical in this type of situation. So people want everybody to obey rules and regulations that might allow us to protect ourselves from, from the pandemic. So, but this then heightens the salience of norms in general beyond just health related norms of you know washing your hands and that those kind of things that are becoming more normative people become more subconscious more attentive to norms so people tend to seek more familiar foods and avoid foreign ones people tend to seek familiar touristic destinations uh, local if if preferably but also well known foreign instead of trying exotic new destinations uh, people become also more appreciative of targets that are conformist themselves then things that conform to norms become more 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 attractive uh, people value obedience and actually people punish the deviance uh, more heavily uh, behavioral conformity to majority opinion becomes also more common. So everything that is normative, that speak about social order, that, that, that talks about norms and things that are standards, then people become more appreciative and, are, and look at those things more favorably. And, and again, these are things that as long as we have that notion that an infectious disease is around us, we're gonna be pushed automatically toward those things. That, that, that are probably going to linger in the mid and long term. Well, people become more socially avoidant. That, that's kind of an obvious one. I'm not going to emphasize that too much. Uh, we are now in social social distancing guidelines. Then, then of course, we're, we're, we're forced to do that. But even after this is gone, people are going to become a little bit more introverted. We're talking about perhaps there are going to be changes in behavior in terms of how we greet people. Uh, you know, in the United States, we greet people with a shake of hands. But in other cultures, people are greeted not with a shake of hand. They are greeted with kisses, you know, one, two, three kisses in the cheek, hugs. Well, those might be things that become that, that in the mid and long term might change a little bit. People also become less tolerant of foreigners. And this notion again of social avoidance, you know, we are staying in our houses with our family and then, you know, social distancing this there is a little bit relative, but as long as we step a foot outside of our homes, then we become more aware of, of others and particularly again, those others that are not very, very similar to me. So then that notion of intolerance is, gonna, is also gonna be staying with us for a while. All right, so I'm gonna move now to a second thing that's happening right now. And this is another psychological mechanism that is not directly associated with infectious diseases. It's more general, but, 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 but talks to it. It, it. It's not completely dissociated from it, but it's this idea of thinking about mortality, thinking about our own death. Uh, we refer to it in the academic literature as mortality salience. And one of the things that happens with, with, with us humans is that we are the only living organisms that know they're gonna die and reflect on that. You know, the rabbit has a self-preservation instinct that all animals have, and the rabbit knows that the fox wants to kill it and eat it. So the rabbit tries to protect itself from that. But the rabbit is not thinking, you know, when, when it wakes up in the morning, uh, well, you know, the fox might eat me today I might be, it's breakfast, and then that produces anxiety in the rabbit. The rabbit goes, ago, goes along with its life. It's not worrying about the fox other than protecting against the fox. But we humans are different. We, we know that we're gonna die. And, and we reflect on that. And when we reflect on that, that causes anxiety on us. Uh, and then humans have developed this mechanism to cope with this anxiety, you know? Religion is a way of coping with this anxiety, the afterlife. In many people, there is the afterlife. And then that helps us to have uh, this, this notion of, okay, this is not the only life I have. More broadly, you know, regardless of religion, there is this notion that culture provides a mechanism for people to symbolically become immortal. So this is what we call this symbolic immortality. It's this idea that I might die, but my lifestyle and my society and my culture goes on. You know, my family goes on, my larger group goes on, my city goes on. And then in a way, I, I gain this idea of transcendence through others, through my cultural worldview. Then when we become aware of our own death, then one of the things that we know from, from research is that then we can try to defend our cultural worldview because it's the way for us to gain this symbolic immortality. It helps us to, to alleviate the tension of, okay, I want, 
I might die one day, but that's not that it's that's it's not all done. There's something that still stays. My society, my culture still stays. And that provides us some level of, of relief of that anxiety. The other thing that we also uh, do when we are more aware of our mortality is that we focus more on safety. We become more vigilant to, in general, avoid things that are risky. So these two things, the effects from the infectious diseases, coupled with this thinking about our own death to really uh, uh, broaden the type of responses that consumers are going to be experiencing in the next months. You know, this notion of, of mortality salience is very acute right now in the United States. You know, we, if you're watching the news, you have a ticker of how many people have died. And you probably can ask people how many people are dead. The last time I checked, today I haven't had time, but yesterday we were above 10,000. And we have that ticker going. We know we are at about 1,000 deaths per day or more. New York is like at a 500 and we're starting to watch those things and we're talking in the news about, you know, the really the key indicator is when we can double the death rate beyond three days. That's where we see the flattening of the core that we call. So, but all that notion about death, forecast of 100,000 to 250,000 people dying, knowing about people who are dying around us, that notion of I'm also here at risk becomes very salient. You know, you see news of famous people uh, being in intensive care. You know, the prime minister of of UK uh, is it's in, it's in the intensive care unit. I don't know how is he doing right now. He wasn't on a ventilator the last time I checked, but he could move to that. He, and, and we don't know if he's going to be around. So this heightened this, this hypersensitivity of mortality that's going to then lead us to defend our cultural worldview and to focus on safety. So let's try to see what this means. You know, this notion of defending our cultural worldview is again, defending the norms, the society, the status quo. It's related to what I talked earlier about the threats from infectious diseases also pushing conforming, conforming to norms. So this reinforces that. And it's like a, it's like a double down on, on the notion of conforming to norm, punishing the violent behavior, the notion of favoring my in-group and discriminating against our group you know, some of this stuff is even blatant right now in the response to to the crisis. You know, in some places, people are becoming protective. Like, you know, I want to hold on to my ventilators. I don't want to share ventilators with other people because I need to protect my group if something bad were to happen in my locality. Uh, you know, we've seen how, how companies are being prevented from exporting, you know, uh, uh, masks and things like that because we need them here in the U.S. Certainly we need them, but then again, we become more hypersensitive of that notion of what's my group and what's good for it. And, and then discrimination against our groups if, if that's, if that's uh, necessary. Focus on safety is this idea of trying to take fewer risks in general. So it's not only uh, uh, you know, trying to avoid health risk, it's, it's being more risk avoidant, preferring the status quo Humans are loss averse in general, but during these times, people become even more loss averse. So then how all of this kind of coupled together to impact uh, decisions that, that, that companies might make and how these decisions could play differently in different cultural environments. So let's move to this idea of what happened cross-culturally with this. All these direct consequences that I, that I talked before and all these psychological consequences, they are applicable in any culture. You know, the, the, the infectious diseases from an, from an evolutionary perspective have impacted the world. So we all humans have that tendency. Uh, and defense of the worldview, we all humans have that, but we know there are some differences across the globe in how people deal with things. We know, for instance, that some of the biases in terms of this infectious disease hypersensitivity is, is, is even heavier in Western cultures because this notion of germ transmission is more common in the individualistic Western cultures. In East Asian cultures, diseases are many, in many cases attributed more to internal reasons that rather than external factors. You know, in Chinese medicine, there is a lot of that internal thing that needs to be dealt with to cure you instead of just looking at what's the external thing that's causing the, the, the disease. And I'm not saying that people in East Asia believe that the coronavirus is an internal thing. 
of course, infectious diseases everywhere are going to be uh, 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 perceived to be coming from outside. And, you know, it's very common, actually, than in East Asia that people wear masks more so than they do it in the United States or in, in, in Western Europe. But what I'm referring to here is when this is gone, or when, when this hypersensitivity to things passes, still in the West, the tendency to look more at others as the cause of diseases is going to be even higher than it is right now compared to East Asian cultures in which is a combination of both others, but also something about myself. Uh, the other thing is this notions of safety concerns. You know, I talked before that uh, uh, with uh, mortality salience, we, we have a flight to avoid risks, focus more on safety beyond only health. Well, we know that there are cultures in which these safety concerns and this emphasis on norms and normative behaviors are naturally more prioritized. And that happens more in collectivistic cultures. East Asia, Latin America are good example of cultures in which these notions of uh, avoiding risk, emphasis on norms, are more important than in individualistic cultures. So then what we will find then is that these effects are gonna probably uh, uh, have some cultural nuances. So the, 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 the path of threat of in, from infectious diseases to the hypersensitivity uh, of the behavioral immune system is probably more likely to be the path that's more commonly followed in Western cultures in which we're gonna be always trying to think that there's something external that's happening to me. That I'm gonna to have to be hyper vigilant to try to protect myself from what others might bring. That notion of uh, discrimination against things that are non-normative, uh, that idea that I'm looking for things that are more standards and familiar than things that look foreign uh, or unfamiliar. That's going to be something that's going to be very, very strong in, in a Western cultural environment after, after this peak passes. Uh, whereas in uh, East Asian and Latin American cultures, what we're going to see is that the path or, 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 the, or the impact of infectious diseases through conforming to norms and attitudes and focus on safety are going to be stronger because these are the, the things that are culturally aligned with the natural tendencies in this society. So people looking for things that are associated with the status quo, trying to look for normative products, products that are standard, products that are that look that that are what my society typically consumes are things that are going to be more heavily emphasized in East Asians and Latin American cultures. So how do all of this then, how do companies cope with this? What do they do? You know, being aware of this, what do we do? Well, we're going to talk, I'm going to talk about this in, at two levels, you know, in the short term and more in the long term. In the short term, uh, there's going to be what we call a crisis management. You know, and this is like any other crisis, this is a crisis. It could be a crisis, the crisis can come from different places. It could be that you have a faulty product and you have to recall it. In this case, is we have this virus. And this is going to impact some companies that have to react to that very quickly. And for some companies, they might be more proactive. But it's going to be there for everybody to respond to it. So the first thing that you do is you assess the impact and the potential blame that you might have in case something that in your internal organization could heighten the response, could make it even more, 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 more negative than, than it is for, for, for everybody around right now. And I'm going to give some examples in a minute. Second thing is you acknowledge and outline steps to deal with this. You know, how do you, how can you minimize the blame that I could get from this crisis if as related in this case to coronavirus, or how can I take advantage of this? And what are some of the actions that I might take? Formulate a response. Then once you know what you need to do, you formulate a response and implement the response. That's that's kind of the ultimate thing. That's typically when you involve advertising and public relations to deal with the response. So let's give you some examples. You know, the airlines. Airlines are some of the of the the one companies that have been more heavily impacted. You know, for instance, this this is from from last week. American Airlines adjusted food and lounge service in response to COVID-19. I, I then even saw another one in which they are trying to stay away from the idea that that you are packing people in the same rows and they're trying to keep people with some distance as flights are, are not going crowded anymore. Uh, 
that's that's a way to deal with okay i don't want people to get contaminated in 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 my flights amazon warehouse that 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 whether they reopen or not, if their workers have COVID-19, then that's another thing that companies are doing, you know, in the distribution channel, trying to avoid contamination of products. Domino's launched custom contactless delivery during this crisis. You know, you can, you don't you don't have to 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 talk to the to the to the to the delivery guy. You don't have to sign anything. You know, it's it's everything. So then, these are things that companies are thinking. You know, well, how can I mitigate my risk during this crisis? This, these are some examples. But some companies don't have direct consequences like this. But what but they can see is some opportunity. You know, we see, for instance, Ford is working with 3M and GE to make respirators and ventilators. Uh, some of that, I think, in the case of Ford, that's not being mandated. Um, you know, there is there is this law here in the United States that the government can can order a company to do things. This was something that emerged spontaneously. I think the one that's being mandated is General Motors, but you know, I might might have that wrong. Well, Joan Fabrics is giving customers free materials to make face masks. You know, we we are now hearing that probably we all should wear some sort of clothing made mask. Well. Joan Fabrics, a company that that sells fabrics, that's that that's what they do, is trying to then they they, they they don't they don't have any threat from this thing. You know, it's not like Joan Fabrics needs to do something to avoid having involving itself in a scandal, but see an opportunity to immerse itself in this and help. James Dyson, the the the, the owner of Dyson company, designed a new ventilator in 10 days and he's making 15,000 for the pandemic fight. Uh, so again, you see a company, Dyson, which is vacuums and, and things, vacuum cleaners and things of that nature. And then the technology can be adapted to a ventilator, it's trying to do that. So it's, it's, it's a good thing to do. It's definitely goodwill that they're going to gain. Uh, and then again, it's the company appears to be a socially responsible company that although it's not, uh, it's not in, it, it, it doesn't have a risk of doing something that's going to that's gonna make it worse, it has a possibility to make things better. Uh, what about the long term? Well, the long term is when we have many things we can do. You know, one of the things that when we think that the norm becomes more important, that uh, we want things to feel familiar, then one of the things that uh, uh, I think companies should be doing, you know, in the next two, three to nine months is make your brand feel familiar. You know, use classic designs and products. This is not the time probably to launch crazy new product. This is probably the time to emphasize the products that you trust, the products that you that have been with you. They, they belong to the cultural worldview. Brands that are iconic of a culture are gonna have it easier time to recover from this than brands that are more foreign. Uh, use and emphasize local production and sources. That's gonna again, bring this notion of familiarity, locality, I know who you are, I can trust you. Emphasize leadership position, even if in a narrow uh, uh, space, you know, this notion that I wanna be aligned with the status quo, then a leader by definition is the status quo, is the, is, is the brand that's preferred by everybody. Everybody knows this is a brand that everybody buys. Then that's normative, that becomes more comforting that then people are gonna be going for that. Then you can claim that leadership even in narrow space. You can be, you know, we know that, that, that for instance, BMW can claim to be the leader in the luxury uh, car category, not in the whole car category, but you can talk about the sport luxury category to be more specific and, and, and emphasize that leadership. That notion of status quo and leadership is gonna become important. Uh, so position as a status quo whenever, whenever possible. The other thing is safety first. Again, as I said, there's a hypersensitivity about safety and, and, and people wanna be safe. And this is particularly the path that's more important in collectivistic cultures in which this notion of safety is, is in any event emphasized in the culture. Then minimize risk for consumers. You know, we talk about the, the health risk, th those are obvious, but any other risk, there is not only health risk, there is also financial risk, for instance. Emphasizing warranties, I think, might be something that becomes very useful uh, uh, going going forward. Uh, conforming to norms, as I say, uh, from 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 an advertising perspective, emphasizing this notion of normative behaviors to kind of promote your products and brands, probably is going to become more effective in the mid and long term. 
emphasizing cleanliness. It's, it's gonna be for, for any company for which cleanliness is an attribute that is important, it's gonna be super, super important. So this is something that going forward is gonna be, is gonna be critical. So then what we see in, in general is that what we have is a combination of effects driven by the psychological responses to infectious diseases, currently to the hypersensitivity to mortality, that probably is gonna go away, but in, in this right time, it's, it's still gonna linger probably for one or two, three months. As we move away from that, the, the threat from infectious disease is probably gonna be the most salient one. Then it's gonna trigger this, this ideas of conforming to norms. And you know, I tried to provide you with some uh, examples of actionable things that company can do to cope with this. So that, that's what I had in terms of my presentation and, I, and I'm gonna, open it up for questions now. I'm gonna stop my sharing and I'm gonna now let Amanda guide the Q&A. Thanks, Carlos. Uh, we've got some great questions here. So I'm gonna um, start with our first one, which came in prior to the webinar, but uh, maybe you could help us understand what trends in the consumer industry you see being accelerated by the coronavirus. Yeah, you know, we were already into a trend toward anything that is online being important. I think now that's gonna become even more important. You know, telecommuting is something that was there before, uh, but now we're all working like that. And we're trying to figure out the pros and cons of that, the effectiveness of that. Mm -hmm. Companies mm -hmm. that are global are gonna start realizing this idea of shifting people around the world for meetings is, is, is a little bit nonsensical and actually risky because you know people can, can bring diseases to a country. Uh, so I think uh, for what we're doing, online education, I think is gonna become a very strong trend. Uh, you know, there's people who are gonna be able to, to come uh, to Illinois this summer to start programs. But if you're doing this program online, then what's the problem? You're staying where you are. Uh, so telecommuting, streaming, online e-commerce, all of that is gonna, is gonna, is gonna get a, a, an even higher boost. And, and with it, all the accompanying economy of, of technology and, and online advertising. Thanks. Next question is uh, around the difference in consumer behaviors related to services as opposed to products. That's very good. You know, in general in services, you always have the human component. Uh, so almost all services or, or, or most of them, if they don't have the, the, the online capability, if they rely too much on human contact, are gonna have the, the health risk associated to it. So services, and for services, issues around cleanliness, safety, are gonna be super critical. Many of the services are gonna develop and become uh, creative to implement online capabilities. You know, like today, for instance, many of the fast food companies uh, have tried to automate their services, not because of concerns with cleanliness and healthiness, but just to, to, to lower uh, the cost. And companies like McDonald's in many of the restaurants in the United States, you can order from a kiosk, you can order from, a, from an app. Uh, well, those are like tricky things. You can, you, you can actually today, you can pump gas without touching the, 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 the keyboard thing in some gas stations. And, and, and I, I would like to ask the audience if anybody's aware of that, but there, there are apps for, from some gas stations, uh, uh, ExxonMobil gas stations, some of them have that, uh, in which you can, through the app, pay. Yeah, you still need to take the pump and put it there, but you, know, you, you wonder, well, why would I bother? You know, not, not, not everybody uses that, but now, well, if I don't need to touch the screen where I put my zip code on my thing, well, I have less contact with things that could really uh, be dirty and contaminate me. So a lot of these things in services, cleanliness, efficiency, minimizing social interaction, it's gonna be important. So companies that are in services need to be rethinking how much they can, they can really introduce these changes. Product is a little bit less problematic because for products, uh, you know, we acquire them and then the notions of cleanliness are, are less critical. Here's where financial risk and, and social risk become more important. You know, as I said, warranties. I think warranties are gonna be things that now are gonna be important to be highlighted. 
uh, and then particular for products, we don't have that in services. So I think it's taking some of these recommendations are gonna be more applicable to services, some are more applicable to products. Thank you. So this question refers to the e-commerce um, comments that you've made, talked a bit about obviously the increase in e-commerce during this time. Um, but wanted to have you chat a little bit around how that is um, uh, impacting the marketing industry more broadly and uh, what marketing strategy, how marketing strategies might change or what new marketing strategies might emerge following this time as e-commerce continues to grow and, and be um, in demand. Yeah, just so e-commerce is, uh, you know, the, the biggest retailers now are Amazon and Alibaba. So those, those, that, those are the, the, the owners of e-commerce and, and, and that, that, that trend I think is gonna continue. And we see that companies that were classic retailers are moving heavily again toward, towards uh, online channels. We think Walmart is growing dramatically. Target also, a large retailer in the United States. It's also, it's also growing dramatically in their online platform. I think that's gonna continue. As, as, as we are gonna spend a month, all of us trying to buy everything online, those of us who can, because unfortunately the digital divide is an issue that not everybody can really uh, uh, afford these platforms and, 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 and use them. But for, for the majority of middle-class people uh, throughout the world, they are heavily relying online, even if before they just did it just, you know, like, like okay, I can sometimes do this online or not. That's gonna continue. Uh, a lot of what we're getting through, uh, how to deal with coronavirus right now, we're getting it through social media. You know, social media activity right now, it's super heavy. And in many parts of the world, that's really what you have to try to get tips of what to do, what are the trends, what things are happening. So that over-reliance on social media is going to continue. And that's going to also change how we marketers deal with the rich people. Uh, you know, we know social media is becoming a more important marketing channel. It's going to just grow even more important than it was before. So what we're seeing is an acceleration on that trend towards a digitized society. Uh, that's going to be more and more, more common nowadays. Thank you. So I know that you're not, not a historian, obviously a professor of marketing, but a good question here around parallels in, in consumer behavior today by comparison to previous pandemics, maybe specifically that one, um, the pandemic we've been hearing so much about from 1918. Uh, so wonder if you have any reactions to that. Well, you know, that one... I don't have too much knowledge about that pandemic and consumer behavior at that time was, you know, if we think about the history of consumer behavior, it really started in the, in the mid 20th centuries when we started studying consumer behavior in the 1940s and 50s. And, you know, if we talk a little bit about history, the first book of consumer behavior was written here in the University of Illinois by, by Jack D. Sheff. Uh, I was a professor at that time here in Illinois, and that was the theory of consumer behavior. The first theory of consumer behavior was actually written here in Urbana Champaign. So, but that was in the, the 50s and 60s. So 1918, you know, we didn't have really any concepts. You know, what we know about what happened in 1918 from an economic perspective is that after a pandemic, there is a stress in society. And, and, and right now there are discussions throughout the world about how to emerge from this. Well, one of the learnings that we got from the past pandemic is that fixing the health issue is more important to be done early than trying to reopen things with the health issue still going on. You know, and some of the studies that were done in, the, in, the, in, in, in this pandemic in the United States shows that cities that address the health issue head on social distancing were able to minimize uh, infections and death recover economically faster than cities that didn't do that, that tried to kind of walk and shoe gum at the same time. Let's try to solve the health issue, but let's try to, to keep the economy going and reopen quickly. So those, those states and cities struggle. Another parallel that I would bring that is more similar in, in the recent times in terms of some notion of consumer behavior was 9-11. It wasn't a pandemic, but during 9-11 in the United States in particular and some other parts of the world, uh, this idea of hypersensitivity to mortality, 
it wasn't in this case infectious diseases, it was mortality. Uh, then discrimination, fly to safety, fly to norms. We saw it and we saw a bomb in, in American iconic companies in the United States that received the bomb because again, being more normative for, for the culture, they, they, they received a, a disproportionate uh, benefit in terms of people coalescing around them in trying to cope with this with these threats. So I, I can see some of that also happening, you know, a, a, a rebounding of, of, of nationalism and, uh, and, and local icons. Thank you. Thanks for putting on your historian hat there and sharing some perspective, really appreciate it. Um, so a, a question here that comes uh, related to a recruiting company. Um, first of all, I wanna thank the participants for using the upvote. This is really helpful to see what questions you all feel are important. So um, those are the ones that I'm posing to you, Carlos. Um, but this, this question is from the perspective of running a recruit, recruiting firm focused on providing um, remote employees. Um, to organizations. Uh, participants are interested in understanding what, um, how you see the, the, the current situation impacting the future of that sector given re the recession and increasing unemployment with qualified workers in large numbers and also a large number of vacancies. Mm -hmm. So this is for recruiting companies, for recruiting people who telecommute? Or, Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think in general, the telecommuting is going to become uh, more and more prevalent. So we're going to see telecommuting being a more common occurrence in companies. You know, all companies somehow now have some version of telecommuting, but it's very informal. It's like, okay, ad hoc, we decide that worker A or worker B is going to have the ability to telecommute. I think now companies are going to have policies to really deal with this. Uh, they're going to be a, a redefinition of, of, of uh, kind of business processes for saying, okay, this type of employees, actually, we better have them to be telecommuters to begin with. And there are a few companies that do that nowadays, but, but that's not the norm. You know, in, in, in many of, of our companies, like if I think here University of Illinois, you know, we really don't have, as far as I know, a, a policy, but now we're all working in telecommuting and, and we're still operating very efficiently, I would say then it's become more common to say, okay, I might actually capture great talent that doesn't have to be on location. And I might actually have that as being the way I operate. Uh, so I, I believe that that's going to be a rethinking of business processes to try to deal with that. And I think companies that promote uh, hiring for telecommuting should try to help companies uh, learn how to do it, you know, because in many cases it's something that is foreign. You know, we've been adapting, and some companies adapt faster than others. You know, if you think in education, for instance, you know, my my kids are in two different high schools, and one high school was ready to start online learning two weeks ago. The other is just starting tomorrow, today. Actually, started today. So it's a learning curve. Uh, and then providing services to help people transition to telecommuting, I think can be part of the package of, yeah, I provide the, the workers, but also I can provide you with the know-how about what type of processes are more likely to be like that. So kind of come, having some sort of a consultant type of approach to this might be something that might be useful. Thank you. You talked a little bit about um, the impact on um, across cultures, but a specific question here around the impact of the pandemic on exports from Asian countries like India and China. Well, that, that, that's that's a good question. You know, I think one of the things that's that's going to happen, uh, as I mentioned, uh, is that let's talk, for instance, the United States. After this, people are going to become more appreciative of American things. Why? Because they're going to be more familiar and in many cases they're going to be more normative. Uh, then foreign products mm -hmm. are going to now have a disadvantage in terms of they're going to be perceived and particularly those who are novel foreign products or novel brands, foreign brands. Traditional foreign brands that have been somehow acculturated might have it easier, but foreign brands that are relatively novel are gonna, I think are gonna, are gonna struggle uh, in the midterm and long term to get a foothold in the, in, in the US market, for instance. And I think this is gonna happen in, in, in every country. There is a lot of talk right now 
about local production chains. Uh, you know, we, we saw it with the ventilators and the, and the masks. They're not made here, or there are some made here, but not all. Uh, then for companies, you know, suppliers that we rely on this global chain, definitely the global chain is going to continue, but can we localize a little bit more? So there are going to be this tendency for trying to go more local uh, in the short and midterm than was in the past. All right, a question here about um, the impact of the pandemic on eco-friendly consumer behavior. Uh, do you see this changing consumer behavior uh, in a pro-environmental way, or do you think that any impacts there might just be temporary? That's a very good question. You know, in, in many, many of environmental things, they have a, a health-related twist. Not all, but some do. You know, some of the things, uh, you know, like uh, for instance, organic foods, uh, they are environmentally friendly. Why? Because, you know, they're typically locally grown. Um, because they are locally grown, then you use less gas and then you contribute less to global warming. Uh, sustainable uh, uh, foods in general have that thing. But they're also good for your health, right? They, they in theory, they, they might provide more vitamins and more antioxidants, which are also good for your health. So I think to the extent that environmentally friendly things have also a health implication and a local flavor implication, I think they're going to be favored. You know, I, I think people are going to move more towards consume local things. Uh, you know, I know better the 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 the, the chain. I know, I feel more comfortable. I know the people. Uh, general environmental behaviors like pollution, for instance, I'm not sure how much that people right now pollution is less because we're all staying at home. Uh, the extent to which people will decide will stay at home. Yeah, we know there's going to be still some social distancing that's still going to stay uh, and, and less travel probably, you know, the travel industry, I think is going to suffer uh, uh, and it's going to take longer for it to recover. Uh, but I think the environmental things that are going to be more durable are going to be the ones that have a health implication. Thanks, Carlos. Uh, so this will be our last question and then we'll wrap things up. Um, kind of going back to the question around services, could you share a little bit um, around your thoughts on how COVID affects the delivery of services such as health and wellness visits, dining, right? Restaurant versus takeout delivery, um, and then the grocery um, um, industry as well, obviously you commented about uh, ordering groceries online. So maybe we can wrap up with that question and then we'll close mm -hmm. things out. Yeah, yeah, it's very good. You know. I wish I, I were wrong, uh, but I think restaurants and services that are traditionally built around uh, heavy social interaction are gonna suffer to recover. It's not gonna be easy. It's not gonna be immediate. It's gonna take longer. And I think in the case of restaurants, mm -hmm. once you know we go back to, okay, we're not six feet apart, I think ideas of very crowded venues and places are gonna struggle to really deliver on that. Uh, so there's gonna be a while in which I think uh, restaurants are gonna have to try to maintain tables a little bit more separate uh, in which people are gonna be more comfortable with carry out and deliver it than they are with going to the actual place. Uh, so that, that's going to stay there. I, I wonder what's going to happen with the airline industry in terms of how, when people are going to be ready to really be again packed like sardines to go from point A to point B, which is the way in which airlines can make money. Otherwise, they, they lose money, unless we're willing to pay for tickets that are going to be more expensive, which is this going to be a little bit of this also supply and demand. Uh, so all of this is service uh, industries that rely on, on, on humans being in very close contact as a way for them to be in their business model are going to struggle. And there's going to be some, some, some rethinking 
Uh, and that's the beauty of a market economy in which then somebody figure out an innovative way of doing things that we haven't thought. You know, nobody thought that we could have a, a, a share riding system like Uber or Lyft uh, 20 years ago. Uh, and it sounded like a genius thing, right? Uh, well, there's going to be a lot of rethinking of industries to make them adapt to this new environment. Thank you, Professor Torelli. Uh, really appreciate all of your great insights today. Thank you also to all of our participants for attending the webinar. We hope you've gained some valuable knowledge and we hope everyone will stay safe and healthy as we weather this pandemic. Thank you, guys.